Come with me, my friend. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Steps That Follow Me. The Steps That Walk? Oh, how did he come to get that name? Because people around here have seen him at night. But he's dead. That's right, he's dead. And they've seen him walking. Oh, it must be their imagination. It ain't their imaginations, I know. I've seen him myself. What are you trying to do? Frighten us? I ain't trying to frighten you, none. <laughs> well, I'll have to. You frighten you. Old Mr. Thomas. The death that walks. Because he'll come for you. <laughs> <laughs> you come for you. I have before me the diary of a dead man. He and his wife were my best friends. The words he has written down tell a tale so fantastic it's almost impossible to believe. Yet I know that Bill and Helen Mason lived the last few months of their lives in dread fear of the slow steps that followed them. It is late evening as I read his words. I have come to their house now so empty and sit in the large overstuffed leather chair in the library. Outside, rain pummels against the side of the house. The wind blows the fall leaves from the trees and the sound of thunder gives vent to the anger of the storm. There's something in the house. A tension. A fear, perhaps. I feel almost as if unseen eyes were watching me. As if someone is here with me. Here in this room. And so I start to read his diary. Living words from the pen of a man who sleeps forever. March 3rd. Today, Helen and I came across one of those delightful old southern mansions. We decided to stop and make a study of the place. And Helen was especially interested in taking some color pictures to illustrate our lecture series in the fall. Well, I guess no one will mind if we take a look around the place. No, I'm sure they wouldn't. Oh, it's a shame that whoever owns the house and grounds that the place run down this way. It must have been beautiful in its day. Yeah, I imagine it was, Helen. Well, the house could still be saved, renovated. Beautiful place. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I- I'd like to get a shot from here. Hmm. Ah, if that turns out, it'll make a nice picture. Helen? Mm-hmm? I wonder what that building is over there. Where? Right over there, just in back of the house. Oh, well, no one's to stop us. Why don't we take a look? All right, let's do I can't understand why anyone would let the grounds and house deteriorate so. Well, it must have cost a lot of money to run a place as large as this, darling. The real estate office probably couldn't find a buyer. Oh, no, you're probably right. And notice the other building doesn't seem to be so run down. No. It's in remarkably fine condition. It must have been built a lot later than the house. It seems to be made of stone. Gray stone. I wonder what it's used for. I don't know. Actually, I believe that someone lived in the old house not too long ago and... I think probably the second building was constructed during that time. Well, it's a crime to let a beautiful old place run down like this. Mm. Well, here we are. Bill? Yes, dear? It doesn't have any windows. Yes, I noticed that. Seems rather strange. Oh, well, maybe it was used for a store. Oh, look at the door. Well, what's the matter with it? I think the lock's broken. Oh, you're right. Why don't we take a look inside? All right. That's all rested through. There. Yeah, that does it. And now to see what's inside. <laughs> well, there might not be any windows, but there's a skylight that lets in the sun. Come on, let's go in. All right. Ooh. So cold. Uh, so I noticed. Helen, what's uh, standing in the center of the floor? That's just what I was going to say. This isn't a storehouse by any stretch of the imagination. It's a mausoleum. That thing in the center of the floor is a sarcophagus. 
stone coffin. There's nothing else in here. Just that, that thing in the center. And yet I feel it's, it's crowded. As if there are things here that we can't see. <laughs> That's nonsense, darling. I always notice how the sun falls across the head of the sarcophagus. Yes, oh, I wonder if we're loud enough to take a picture. Well, I doubt it, but you could try. Well, I might as well if it turns out that. Yeah. What are you two doing in here? We noticed the lock was broken, and so we came on in. You shouldn't have done that. Why not? We didn't do any harm. Well, I'm sure of that, but he won't like it. Who won't like it? The thing that sleeps in that stone coffin. What are you talking about? Just what I said. You didn't notice the writing over the door when you came in, did you? What writing? You didn't notice it then. That's a shame. Because you didn't know what you was getting into. Getting into? Look, I'm sorry, but I just don't understand. We didn't hurt anything. We're not intending to steal anything. Well, that don't make no difference. He doesn't care what your reasons were. Who is... Who? They called him Mr. Thomas when he was living. They called him the... Death that walked. Now that he's dead. The death that walks. How did he come to get that name? Because people around here have seen him at night. But he's dead. That's right, he's dead. And they've seen him walking. That must be their imagination. It ain't their imagination. I know. I've seen him myself. What are you trying to do? Frighten us? I ain't trying to frighten you none. <laughs> I don't have to. He'll frighten you. Old Mr. Thomas. The death that walks. I uh, think we'd better go there. You don't believe what I'm telling you. That's all right with me. I don't care what you believe, but you listen to what I'm saying now. If I was you, I'd get away from here as fast as I could. Not just from this place, but from the town, from this part of the country. Why? You want me to tell you a little of the story? Yes. All right. Maybe you'll believe me then. Old Tarnish came here from someplace in Europe. I say old, but he really wasn't old. He just seemed that way. He brought the house and grounds here and had them cleaned up. So the place looked like it was brand new. And he started building the dead building. There's something funny about town. There's something in his eyes that make you frightened of him. His eyes, they looked like the eyes of a, of a dead man. He didn't act like anyone I ever knew. He was always talking about dead. Always telling me he could come back after death. And I was the caretaker then, just like I am now. After this building was completed, I used to watch him at night when he'd come out here. It seemed like he was in some sort of a trance. He'd stay out here for hours. And when he'd come back to the house, his, his eyes would glisten and shine. So you couldn't hardly look at him. A week before he died, he told me that as long as I lived, I was to take care of this place. Because if I didn't, he, he'd come back and kill me. Died. Just like that. And he was put in here, in his coffin. And one night, about two months later, when the moon was full, I heard a noise. And when I come out to look, I saw the door to this place opening. And him come out in the moonlight. And I could hear his footsteps. It sounded queer and hollow like. Turn around and I could see his face in the moonlight. Pale and pasty. Sick looking. And those eyes of his seemed like two burning coals of fire. He seemed to be looking at me. And I heard him say, They have disturbed me and the moon has awakened me. I shall follow them. That's what he said. And I heard it just as plain as you're hearing me. And then... He vanished in the night. Towards morning, I heard his footsteps again. And I heard that big iron door closing. And I knew he was back. The next day in town, I heard that Alf Cummins had died the night before, screaming something about not meaning to go into the mausoleum. I knew who killed him. And that's all there is to the story? Well, that's just part of it. It's happened again and again in the last ten years since he's been dead. 
Folks around here say he'll follow you wherever you go if you come inside here. Well, in that case, why haven't you been killed? Because he needs me. <laughs> he ain't going to kill me. But if I was you, I, I'd get out of this part of the country just as soon as I could. Let's go back to the hotel, Bill. Yeah, it's all right, dear. You going to get away from here? Yes, we'd better get going. Yeah, I wish I'd have been here when you come, but I was in town getting this lock. You think I'll leave this door unlocked? That ought to satisfy. There's the inscription, girl. Yes, that's the writing I mean. Got a nice sentiment, ain't it? If you enter here, into the realm of death, I shall follow you and bring him with me. March 3rd, later. I sit here and write these words. It's quite late and the moon has risen full in the sky. Helen is standing by the window looking out. For some reason, I am frightened. And yet I know that a few months from now I shall only laugh at the memory of my fright. However, in the morning, I do believe that we will leave this place. All true? Yes, for tonight at least... I think we'll be leaving tomorrow, Helen. Oh, I'm glad. I don't believe the caretaker's story. And yet I'm afraid. Yeah. It's a beautiful night. Yes, isn't it? That moon's so big and full that it could... Bill. Yes, dear? Look down there at the street. There's a man down there. Oh, there's nothing to be... Bill! He's looking straight up at us. And pointing to us at... Look at his face, Bill. Look at his face. Pale. Pasty looking. And his eyes... Like two burning coals of fire. You are listening to the tale of the steps that follow me. As I read these pages... The words stare up at me, and their formations bring to life a nameless terror which I feel all around me. Outside, the storm still rages, yet the sound of it fades from my mind as the terror in the pages of the volume I hold before me becomes increasingly apparent. Watch third. Still later. The man down in the street, whomever he was, left after about ten minutes. He has given us quite a fright. Where I felt any doubts as to whether or not we should leave this place, they've all been dispelled now. Helen has just gone to bed. I think I shall do the same. If we're going to leave in the morning, you'd better get to sleep, Bill. I want to get out of here as soon as I can. Yes, I was just coming to bed, Helen. That man we saw... Yes? It might be only coincidence. Do you really believe that, Helen? Are you trying to talk yourself into it? I guess I'm trying to rationalize it. I'm afraid I'm not doing a very good job of it. I don't know what to believe. It could be coincidence, but... somehow I'm afraid it isn't. Then you think that... Maybe. Now, don't worry about it, Helen... By tomorrow, we'll be several hundred miles from here. And I doubt if whomever it was will follow us. They sound just like the steps that caretaker described to us. Yes, but we saw him walk away. I didn't know he's in the room upstairs. Well, it's probably someone else. It's not, I know it's not. All right, all right. Just a minute, I'll call the desk. This is William Mason in 316. Can you tell me who has the room directly above mine? Clerk's going to check. Yes? Oh, I see. No, no, thank you very much. What did the clerk say? The room directly above ours is unoccupied. March 4th. We left the hotel a short time after we heard the steps. 
We went immediately to her car and drove all night and all day. And are stopping now in a motel almost a thousand miles away. It's reassuring to know that he could not possibly follow us. I am very tired. Go to bed and get an early start in the morning. Helen? You asleep? No. What are you thinking about? The words that were written above the mausoleum door. If you enter here into the realm of death, I shall follow you and bring him with me. to pay the bill. The man who owns the motel said a strange, pasty-faced man had been in earlier and told him to tell me that he would follow me. March 11th. It's impossible to get any material together that'll help me in my work. Everywhere we go, he's there also. Yeah, Mr. Mason, this guy said it was all right for you to go on ahead because he was going to follow you. March 22nd. No, he didn't leave a name. He just said that he'd be in touch with you. April 7th. Never saw anyone who looked like that before. Be a friend of yours, Mr. Mason? April 18th. He said he'd follow you. Told me to say he'd follow you. May 15th. Follow you. Follow you. Follow you. Follow you. Follow you. Follow you. No. No, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. <laughs> I, I wish there was something I could do, Helen, but there's nothing. I've done my best, but I can't. If we go home, it'll be the same thing. Maybe. Maybe it won't. I can't stand this anymore. All right, all right, darling. We'll leave for home right away. June 23rd. We arrived home this evening. I called Gary as soon as I could. He said he'd be out within the hour to see us. wasn't able to help us in any way. I really didn't expect any help. I was hoping that he might be able to offer some concrete suggestion as to what to do. However, last night was the first night in months that we haven't been aware of his presence. Maybe, maybe Helen is right. Perhaps he won't follow us here. July 3rd. We've not seen or heard anything unusual since we first came home. I feel as a man might feel who has been given a new lease on life. July 10th. Still nothing. August 19th. For the past two months, a feeling of peace and security has enveloped the house... Helen and I have been able to go around with no sense of danger nor of dread. But last night, that feeling was shattered. Gary had come out for dinner. It was almost ten o'clock. Well, it's about time for me to get along. Oh, it's only ten, Gary. Sure, you don't have to go so soon. I'm afraid I must, Helen. Tomorrow's a working day for me. I thought I might be able to get you into the game of chess. Oh, some other time, Bill. Well, next time, don't stay away so long. Don't worry. I think we ought to... Tell me, is someone upstairs? No. Well, listen. <gasps> He's back. Who's back? The man we told you about. Those are his footsteps. I'd know them anywhere. I should. I've heard them enough. What are you going to do? 
Look, will you come upstairs with me, Gary? Yes, of course. You stay here, Helen. Oh, don't go up there, Bill. Don't let him, Gary. No, Helen. This time I'm going to meet him face to face. And I'm going with you. No, you're not. You're going to stay right here. You ready, Gary? Yes. Okay, let's go. Be careful. As careful as we can. If he is up there, what are you going to do? I don't know. We'll find that out when the time comes. Our steps came from the guest room. I don't hear anything. Well, let's see if he's in there. Stand back, Gary. I'm going to open the door. Right. It's empty. There's no one in here. But I heard someone up here. Yes, he was here, but he's gone. I can feel it when he's near me. I know that... Come on. Helen! Helen, where are you? Helen! There she is. In the front room. Helen. What's the matter, Helen? Helen... Answer me. She can't feel. She's sitting there with her eyes wide open. She's dead. August 23rd. We buried her today. As I sit here in the empty house writing this, I know that Thomas will come for me, too. I am writing this in the hope that someone will find it, read it, and maybe understand my death. <laughs> it's lonely here, yet suddenly I have the feeling that I'm not alone. Someone is here with me. room with me. I'm afraid to turn and meet him. Have those eyes of his burning into me. And yet, yet I must. I pray that someone reads this. Perhaps he will... He will... third entry was the last he ever made. The feeling of creeping horror that runs through the pages has imparted itself to me. And I sense that someone is here with me. Of course, I realize that it's only my imagination. But I can't shake that feeling. There is someone here. Who... Who are you? Who do you think I am? Characters and events portrayed on this program are fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead or to actual events is purely coincidental. Featured on this program were Carl Grayson as William Mason, Eloise Cover as Helen Mason, Richard Thorne as Gary, and Sam Siegel as the caretaker. Original music moods were created and performed by... Harold Turner. These programs are directed by Leroy Oliger.